invite you to yet another webinar as part of our series of webinars that we've been hosting. So today's webinar is indeed a very special one. All of us are lucky to have the eminent architect, Professor Eugene Pandala with us today to share his experiences and his knowledge. Uh, I would now uh, call upon our principal, Professor Shashank Chakradio, to give us the welcome address. Sir, you're muted, sir. Shashank, sir. Thank you, uh, Praveen, sir. Uh, good evening to everyone, all the students and faculty and the, the practicing architects uh, for the the 10th edition of this webinar series of MIDAS. Uh, actually, few days before we thought of uh, bringing the series of seminars in an attempt to uh, bring more and more knowledge to the doorsteps of the students, especially when uh, this we are caught and we are forced to stay at home and the better utilization of the time of the students was one of the issues. So, we thought of uh, bringing uh, webinars to uh, the students and of course we thought of opening up that to other uh, people also, students from other colleges also. So we are happy that we are coming up with the 10th version of that today. Uh, today we have very eminent personality with us. Uh, at times when we are facing the challenges and the the various problems like global warming and climate change and water shortage and air pollution and whatnot. Uh, it is high time that we get into the practices, building practices which will not uh, go for over exploitation of the resources of the earth. So to throw more light on that, uh, we have uh, architect uh, Professor Eugene Pandala who has been practicing in the field of this sustainability and his designs are evident of that. Uh, I am very much happy to have him here. Uh, actually, we wanted to have him uh, personally, physically in our college, but then uh, these are the compulsions and so at least he, we are happy he is available online today. Uh, and I request all the students to make use of this opportunity and ask the questions so that you get more and more from uh, architect who is very much experienced in the field. So I welcome on behalf of uh, Mark Institute of Design and Architecture, Pranabhumi, I welcome uh, architect Professor Eugene Pandala to this online uh, session. And I welcome all the students and the faculty for the same. Uh, thank you. Uh, over to Professor Senthil. Thank you, Principal Sir. Uh, very good afternoon to one and all present here. I'm Professor Senthil Mani. I take immense pressure to welcome our uh, webinar guest, architect Eugene Pandala. Architect Eugene Pandala is an Indian architect, urban designer and heritage conservator, known for building with the values of environmental sustainability. His passion for natural heritage conservation transforms him to explore deeper into affordable, sustainable development and architecture. He did masters in urban design from School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. He had his fellowship in heritage conservation at the University of York and at Fort Brockers in U. The BBC story described architect Eugene Pandala's work as a glorious return to tradition, definitely adopted to modern day needs. His acquaintance with Laurie Baker's work in late 70s and an opportunity to meet Hassan Fatih during his students' day at School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi in early 80s influenced him to research into vernacular technologies of various regions in India. He started his career as an educator, founding the head of Second Architecture School in Kerala in 1985, while having his architecture practice all along. His active role in INTAC as its state co convener helped to promote and strengthen the cultural and natural heritage conservation movement in Kerala. And he is a permanent invite for the Art and Heritage Commission, Government of Kerala, since it was constituted. He is one of the eight members of the newly formed housing policy maker for Kerala state post the flood disaster of 2018. His unique architectural style paved way to many awards and recognitions. In 2011, Lalit Kala Academy awarded him the first Laurie Baker Award. In 2008, Inside Outside Magazine awarded him the Designer of the Year Award for Eco-Friendly Buildings. In 2005, Inside Outside Magazine awarded him Commendation Award for 
Thiruvananthapuram is for Heritage Conservation Project. In 1999, JK Architect of the Year Awards gave a commendation award for his residential building built with mud in 1996. Fort Cochin Heritage Conservation Project, Trivandrum East Fort Conservation Projects are often cited as a good examples of Kerala Heritage Conservation Initiatives. This was led by Eugene Pandala's conservation team enabling the state government to win the Patta Award. His tsunami rehabilitation projects and building for hospitality industries receives a wide acclaim due to its interwoven involvement with the nature. Eugene Pandala was also a keynote speaker of 2016 361 degree conference in Mumbai. British Council hosted Eugene Pandala for his great talk series in India. It is an honor having you with us today, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, good evening. I mean, just uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of your webinar series. And, uh, it's a, I think uh, it's a nice way to be with uh, with all of you, you know, sitting at home and talking to you really in a relaxed way without traveling. In fact, uh, this pandemic is uh, giving us lots of uh, insights to how we can communicate and be together without, you know, actually. Uh, traveling and you know to one place and uh, wasting a lot of resources and energy. So in fact, uh, even nature is actually uh, so happy. You can look around, see the changes that is happening around so the wildlife, the birds, and the nature itself is, uh, seems to be very happy because you know we are not uh, disturbing the like the way we used to do it. You know by Flying around in aeroplanes, big, 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 you know, birds that made. <clears throat> so, sustainability is a very important thing. Uh, you know, we we we, uh, we started thinking about it very recently after noticing all these uh, problems that we face, you know, around us. Uh, nature, nature is actually the weather is going wild and things are going the abnormal. And, uh, you know, then, I mean, of course, the scientists were looking uh, what is happening around us and uh, global warming is something which we all know about. And uh, it is all, if it, it's all put as facts. And uh, we can see that, you know, in, I'll just share a screen to show you, you know, what uh, to begin with, like, <clears throat> in fact, this is a, this is a dead, given by National Geographic magazine. In 2015, you know, world, 50% of the population of the world was living in urban area and 50% were living in total area. And uh, the urban area, that is, uh, you know, emissions, the urban population produced about 76% of carbon emissions. The village, I mean, the rural area, I mean, they just produced 24%. And you know, the 76% carbon, uh, as we look into it in a detailed way, it happens from various, uh, you know, sources. A major so source is uh, the building industry. About 30 to 35 to 40% of the emissions is supposed to be from the building industry. That is, you know, to make uh, resources to build buildings that is the embodied energy, energy that is uh, used to sustain the building, you know, like making it more comfortable by using things like that. So we were actually uh, using a lot of fossil fuel, which has resulted in you know, this greenhouse gases. I don't think we should go deeper into it because you know we have more things to speak about. And in 2050, this, uh, the population is going to move towards urban area. And uh, about three fourths of the population is going to move to urban area. That's what that's a, that's a, the present projection. Uh, it is like likely to happen like so. But fortunately, I mean, after COVID, I I have I feel that people are going to uh, stay back in the villages. I hope you know. And if you provide opportunities, they can stay back in the villages because this is an opportunity for everyone. This is a, I think this is a very, very, very famous uh, 
data that uh, we all should be concerned about. This is 2002. You know that this is a kind of the red line indicates a kind of uh, uh, emissions from fossil fuel. And by 2020, it, it's going it's going to grow up like so. I don't know whether you're able to see the my cursor. Are you able to see the cursor? And by 2020, we had to actually bring down the emissions. I mean, so it's shown in the graph. And by 2030, Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you, sir. Clear. Okay. By 2030, the global temperature has to be brought down by 2 degrees. We have to reduce the carbon by 50%. That is a fact. That is that's a study that, that indicates that that's really required for global warming. And how to fix it? We have that's a question in front of our front of us. <coughs> so I briefly go through that and make it fast. See, as a person, as a person, everyone should. This is a this is a request by National Geographic magazine. After this, it, this was actually this article came in um, 2015 November uh, magazine, uh, which was. Uh, associated with the uh, climate summit in Paris and uh, <clears throat> they said every one of us should contribute to mitigate global warming by making uh, make a change by, by, by making a change in your lifestyle and uh, one of the beautiful uh, you know illustrations they showed is a, is a small house made uh, in New York that is uh, six square feet house, just a house made, you know, with the net space of nine eight by twelve space, and that means like you have to reduce the footprint of what we are doing. So we have to think differently. We have to think uh, differently and uh, change our uh, use of resources. Bring it down. And uh, in fact, 80% of the mining that is done today is uh, river sand. And that river sand, a, a major portion of the river sand is going to build, uh, is, is, is used for building up bridges and uh, buildings and for infrastructure construction. So 80%, <clears throat> that's it. Like so. So things, there are a lot of data which come like that. And uh, we'll just jump to uh, to to know what is actual actually sustainable building and how what is all this green building that we all talk about. <clears throat> so uh, this green building uh, movement that uh, that happened, and uh, many players, industry, you know, people from the industry, they were very very smart to come in just to it and um, coming out with the certification program in us they started with a program called lead certification and uh, india also started lately by calling it as uh, igbc uh, indian green building congress which is a part of the industries industrial uh, organization <clears throat> industries confederation you know they formed and uh, providing green building so that uh, they can actually be a part of the whole movement. In fact, if you look at uh, this uh, green building initiatives, uh, uh, they are well organized, and uh, everyone thinks that green building is a sustainable building. And sustainable building to have it make a sustainable building, we have to have certification. So without certification, you can't build green buildings. That is all. That's the confusion that everyone is having. You know how to build. What is a, a certified uh, product that we can use to build a clean building, a sustainable building? And all that confusion happens. <coughs> is it uh, uh, this all the so called green buildings? It is something which is a big topic which we have to discuss uh, in, in depth. In fact, we, most of us, you know, who are uh, 
reasonably uh, you know uh, mean thoughtful about it green building and uh, sustainable building technology is evolving field it's just emerging it's emerging emerging field so many, there are a lot of players who are coming in and most of the people are saying that it you have to have kind some kind of certification to uh, you know make it green or uh, to make it green you have to have certification for for platinum certification or gold certification or silver depending on the purse that you have <laughs> but unfortunately their solutions are very expensive very so costly that only uh, 90% 90 to 95% of the people can't afford that so that that's a kind of scenario like it is so expensive it costs more than 5 uh, to 6 times you know of a construction structure so that doesn't it's not i say that it's not sustainable because it's not uh, it's not in people majority of the people you know it should when you talk about sustainability it has to be affordable at all also otherwise it is not sustainable the whole idea is to sustain the planet the planet just not the we are not the living uh, things in the planet you know we also have biodiversity and uh, we have to consider biodiversity and geodiversity that means you you have lots of supporting you know millions and millions of organisms that uh, live with us and we have to be supportive with everything otherwise we can't move forward it's just not building or planting trees to make it make it green like the way the green building and other other such uh, movement is uh, is doing right now just not you know you mean and if you look at green building uh, what they, what they just talk about planting trees and uh, you know building and basic things but it's not so this uh, sustainability actually has to be worked it it should be affordable and it should be uh, uh, it should be biodiversity inclusive uh, development whatever development that we do should not only consider us but it should consider the biodiversity that is around us in fact the traditional system that we had in india they we call vastu and all it's not the kind of vastu we practice by right now but it's the it's the kind of including all the living organisms around that worshiping them we had we used to have worship the trees you know because tree is just not a tree like so let's come back to the point because i i would like to say what is sustainable building sustainable is basically affordable and what are the fundamentals of sustainable practice you don't have to go for green certification to get uh, build it to make it sustainable building. you don't have to have knowledge about their green certification programs you don't have to to make a good sustainable building all what you do is basic understanding of nature and these are the fundamentals of sustainability that is one is that reduce the use of resources and uh, what uh, uh, is uh, available to us for reuse so suppose if you get something which is suitable for reusing we we should be and to store if you have a building which is uh, by retrofitting it if you can if you can use it again then uh, we should be able to restore it there are a lot of technology for retrofitting and strengthening it if it's not structurally so you can retrofit it a bit and that then another r is uh, recycle if Uh, some products are not usable try to recycle it because you know we we actually we are making buildings and we are demolishing it we are all, and lots of waste we are producing a lot of waste and uh, we we should find out ways to recycle it and uh, the next way to do is to replenish the nature with, uh, so by planting more trees and allowing more biodiversity to play around with it and like so so these are the fundamentals like uh, so more important is the is our approach to nature so that is biodiversity inclusive development whenever you, if you if you are planning if you are asked to do a, a building in a property so what currently what we do is we just have a specification right to the start saying that we should uh, clearing and leveling the site and cost but we don't consider the kind of biodiversity that sits there we have to be more careful we have to understand what is sitting there what how many 
trees are there what is happening in the tree a tree is just not a tree as i told you earlier yeah? it, it has got lot of micro organisms above its uh, trunk and uh, below the ground also trees all the trees interact with themselves you know and only a recent study which shows that all the trees <coughs> they share their resources they share so many things among themselves but it's not uh, same species of tree but it can be different type of species which shares many things under the ground so there is a there's a interconnected system which is below the ground so those are very complex so now we don't have time to go much about it but this is fundamentally this is it green buildings are not just the system, i mean not the kind of sustainable buildings that what we want all the buildings that we made before we started the industrial revolution or before we started using steel and cement were all sustainable because we never had air conditioners we never had uh, you know artificially uh, you know modifying uh, equipment i mean the equipments which could com- make us comfortable you know we didn't even have fire so we usually used to depend on the nature by using passive cooling things and uh, and air conditioning was not a not a thing you know even arab countries they could have uh, comfortable buildings by uh, looking uh, you know carefully into the nature's ways and uh, using stack effect and passive cooling systems and having heat management they made comfortable spaces you know to be with so there are a lot of ways to build uh, by using these traditional technologies and, and all the buildings you don't have to get a, a traditional building certified to make it green that means if you have a heritage building you don't have to it's a foolish thing to uh, ask for certification and if you have a if you build a mud structure it's very foolish to go and ask for a certification because you know it's, they, they don't have they, they don't have a code for that so many such ridiculous things happen you know, like if you're making a building natural you don't have to go to them for certification if you have a passive be cool building you will stand you your 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 you are chance of uh, uh, you know you know winning it it will have much better uh, ratings if you equate the rating uh, criteria with the buildings that you made naturally by using natural systems so in short all the systems that uh, that is uh, talked about for sustainable practices is all available for more traditional practices we have technology to build without cement we have technology to build foundations without cement we have technology without going for reinforced concrete without using steel or cement we can build multi storied buildings are you know were constructed without the use of all this uh, new age material but but i uh, am not averse with the new materials we can use it we can we have to use new materials wherever it's required you know and I'm, i don't don't say that we are not using cement concrete or cement or all this thing <coughs> we can use it but we should not abuse it we use wherever it's required so i think uh, with that uh, i'll uh, i think i i I'll, we'll just move to your question discuss further when we move to the question Is that okay? Uh, yes, sir. That is okay, sir. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Eugene, sir. I think uh, the first few uh, information we've got is good uh, food for thought. Uh, the webinar has been uh, planned in such a way that uh, followed by uh, Eugene, sir's uh, short uh, introduction, we'll be having a discussion along with the MIDAS students. So I would now call upon the MIDAS students who are divided into groups. so each group uh, covers a particular uh, project of eugene sirs so now we would go on to this uh, discussion session uh, i would just request the guests who have uh, come in to wait uh, till the end wherein we have a question and answer session for the guests so this question answer that just follows this discussion is purely for the mida students so i think we can start that session uh, so the first group can we have the question please Oh yes sir Hello sir I am Aksha Ravi from the 5th year uh, my question is about the Saraya Toria in Madhya Pradesh so uh, this river riverside retreat is uh, located among many culturally and historical 
play uh, important uh, uh, locations like the Rewak and Panna Tiger Reserve and uh, Kajuraho in Madhya Pradesh. So how did the planning of this retreat reflect on its culturally enriching surroundings? And could you also elaborate on the planning and site planning of the retreat? Yeah, thank you, Akshay. Uh, uh, we have one more question uh, related to the same uh, project. Uh, could you have the next question, also? Amrita? Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Amrita from a final year. My question is, you've been using a lot of local construction materials and techniques. What were the construction materials and techniques that were particularly borrowed from the region around Sarai? And could you also explain about the Baitak lawn space roofing, which is, which is very distinguishing? Thank you, sir. OK. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. See, uh, Sarai at Toria is a very, uh, very important location. It's very close to Kajrahu, just one hour from Kajrahu. And it, it's at the river bank of, I mean, the bank of uh, River Ken. And it's also close to uh, a tiger reserve, I mean, the national park, Padna National Park. And uh, besides all this, there is lots of, uh, you know, population, tribal population around this uh, station. And uh, lots of palaces also around in, in that place, because, you know, this Kajarao, happened around, uh, in, you know, in the very um, aggressive and important cultural um, center. So there's a lot of things to study from, there was a lot of things available for me to study also. When I approached, I mean, the client uh, called me to do this project. I had a great opportunity to, to go around, see what was, how people built, how, uh, what is their kind of architecture and the materials that they use for building and the technology that they use for heat transfers and all that and many things like you know even their their kind of uh, beautiful way of going about approach to making buildings and the the especially the the foundation systems the the wall systems and the the roofing systems and uh, all that. So it was, uh, in fact, uh, a, a good time, a, a good part of my uh, case study happened around that couple of villages and uh, around about four or five kilometers around that place. We had many materials, like, you know, they, one of the main materials that the, 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 the hats or the rich people used was panna stone. That's a, it's a stone, which is a good limestone, stone, limestone, you know, and and uh, the tribals and the common man used mud as a, as a, as a material for building their houses. And uh, the way they used the mud was uh, amazing. They had a formulation. Some people used uh, different mud, which was gathered from different locations to mix it together and uh, make it uh, sort of make it more harder and uh, suitable for building the wall. The technology that they used was uh, cob. So, and the roof was also uh, like the tribe. What the tribals used was basically, uh, you know, thatch gathered from around the village villages grasses. And uh, the timber also was local, like uh, local timber. Like even the um, what what do you call it? Neem tree. Neem is that, uh, I don't know what you call it in Tamil Nadu, but it's a very common thing. I think the botanical name is uh, Azadika Indica or something like that, yeah. So, and other 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 trees also were there. Like what they, that was a kind of common material. So we, uh, so I gathered uh, some, uh, you know, masons and uh, I had, I though I'm not that good in Hindi, but uh, we man I managed to, make a team who could work on my project <laughs> and uh, in fact it, it was an amazing experience like putting together all their, their local knowledge and the materials and uh, with my uh, my knowledge of these materials 
I I tweaked it a bit. I, I means means I modified it a bit to to such that we could use it for that kind of project. And uh, that is the kind of procedure that I had to go through. And the layout of the building was very loose. We didn't have uh, it's about three acres property, and we had only about twelve uh, uh, buildings to accommodate it. In fact, my client uh, was very particular that we didn't we shouldn't use cement. So I also, I mean, that's that was my uh, request, and he they both of them. So basically, my clients one was a wildlife photographer, and uh, her husband wildlife photographer. She's from UK, and her husband uh, scientist, tiger scientist. So they really took part in the whole process, and uh, so. Let me use. I didn't even. I I suggested for a damp proof course by using a, a damp proof uh, cement concrete uh, belt with uh, four inch thick. But they said, they, can you do without that? But okay, I then I did something without that by using coal tar and you know local locally available, available material to sort of uh, make it damp proof. So like so, the thatch roof was uh, modified uh, a bit. You know, to take care of many things, which I improved that uh, thatch roof systems. And I uh, recently, when I went there, uh, I mean, I understand, I understood that uh, this technology which I did, I, I mean, contributed by modifying modifying a couple of layers, adding a couple of layers, is accepted by the villagers, and now they are doing it. The villagers are now adopt kind of multi-layer roofing systems. So that kind of thing. So the planning was quite, uh, you know, uh, very uh, loose and very uh, not so technically planned. Worked out, allowing all this biodiversity. We didn't keep, we didn't actually erase the, the biodiversity from that place. I mean, because of, we wanted the wildlife to be very active in and around that place without touching anything. Like you know, still you know, we, we could find most of the things moving around freely, like the way it was earlier. So that is the kind of approach I used in that. So I mean, the floor floor of uh, the veranda of these cottages which we build, we use cow dung and we use cow dung flooring and also for the restaurant. And we got we got the local uh, tribal uh, people to sort of make drawings on the floor to make it more interesting, you know, with lights, chunam. That kind of thing. So, uh, so they were also employed. They were also kept uh, by being more responsible to the village. And uh, the the clients were quite good. That they uh, they actually uh, their practice of um, I mean sustaining it also uh, by uh, they, they that is actually they support the local village that they buy chicken from the local people and vegetables which is grown there. A part of the property was developed uh, to be a garden for to to grow vegetables, organic vegetables, and it is uh, it was powered by 11 kWa solar power, so it's not depending on the energy grid. <coughs> and most interesting thing is that they don't operate the resort for three months during the hot summer months because um, it's not air conditioned. Sir, they can, said that sir, not can you share the pictures? Sorry, uh, sorry for disturbing you, sir. Can you share the pictures? Uh, yeah, because yeah, others yeah, will yeah, be yeah, seeing yeah, the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, sir, yeah. sorry for oh, interrupting you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sir, I do. Yeah. So this is the project. Can you see it? It isn't shared yet, sir. Not shared. Okay. Can yes, you see sir. it now? Yes, sir. We can see it now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's good that you told me. This is a, a photovoltaic system, and uh, the floor. You can see the floor. This is uh, cow dung floor, and uh, this white graphics was done by the tribal. 
you can see the drastic nature of the uh, of the this is a, a you know a small bridge which i designed uh, to span it's about 40 50 feet you know i designed by using steel structure in combination with bamboo to reach the other side and these uh, these ones are uh, basically this is all mud it's all cob and there's a macha you know that macha is also a concept which they have uh, for in wildlife places where they have wildlife uh, it's just a higher point from there to a uh, watchtower to look after the kind of things around and this this is a kind of landscape you know not i mean i didn't put any plants which are alien these are all naturally occurring plants which, uh, so you can see the ground the this is a veranda where which was uh, you know we use cowden as a flooring material and the stones these are natural stones panna stones to do the flooring See, we used I used oxide for flooring. You know, we didn't go for any, any other material but oxide, color oxide. This is you can get different colors. And uh, see, the roof is a multi-layered roofing system. This is a GI sheet, and this is uh, bamboo. I've used different different systems in different rooms. You know, this is bamboo and GI sheet. On top of it, we had attached uh, this. This uh, flooring is oxide. That's the interior. It's very basic. It's not very. It's very rustic, and that is a kind of staircase that goes up. And the washrooms, large washrooms, and uh, uh, you can see that this is a wet area and uh, this is a dry area. And oxides, uh, you can mix uh, colors to match, mix and match, to to get amazing texture and color. It's a lime wash, lime plastered wall. So I use different colors in different to give different to uh, cottages, like so. So this is scrub. You know, this is this for scrubbing. Natural stones picked up from the riverside. That's a restaurant. So I think uh, shall we move on for the any any anything yes. more to uh, yeah this is a I mean no. this is what is supplying power to the whole project. It's nine KW. Yeah. We can go on to the next project, sir. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, we uh, have the next group. Questions? Good evening, sir. Uh, this is Simika from fifth year. My question to you is that uh, typically the earthen buildings are found in dry and arid climate. Talking about your project, uh, Banasura Hill Resort, which is located in Bayanat, falls under tropical wet climate. I believe the climatic conditions would have been a major concern throughout, despite uh, the construction was completed within a short period of time. So, could you throw some light on the challenges that you were faced with? Thank you, Simeka. Uh, just one more question with the same, regarding the same project, sir. Next question, please. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Roshni from Final Year. My question is about the landscaping part. What was the uh, measures taken to conserve the ecological balance of the uh, traditionally, I mean, what are the ecological balance of, to maintain the natural biodiversity, sir? Right. Yeah. Thank you, Roshni. So it's, it's coming in the same, it's, it's in the same, uh, same project, right? Uh, talking yes, about this the is the Pandasura Hill Resort. This is Banasra, like, yeah, yeah, right. I understand. Yeah, Hill Resort. See, the one first uh, question that you said that it is uh, normally used in dry climates and uh, only used in dry climates and places where there's no much, not much of rain. But it's not so. 
Uh, I mean, it, if you look at it, in in fact, in Kerala, most more than about 80 percent of the houses were built with mud. Traditional houses, you know, the, even the place where I live, my house was partially made with uh, mud and uh, cut earth, lat rate. So if you look at uh, this uh, construction all along the western coast of uh, Eastern Ghats, you call it Western Coast, Western Ghats, right? We call it the Eastern Ghats or the you know, I know, I hope what I mean. Right from Cape Kanyakumari up to, you know, Gujarat, we have this Western Guard. And uh, there, uh, if you look at, you know, the poor man's houses, you know, even the rich ones, they used to build with mud. And uh, it is, even palaces were made, built with mud. There are many examples of palaces. And you, you, I mean, we have heavy rains in this coastal area. This western, this monsoon really affects all these areas. And uh, yeah. there are lots of beautiful houses coastal, closer to the beach, which is built by using mud. And some of them still exist. So we have uh, mud structures, not just in, in uh, dry climates. It is there in... Uh, uh, places where you have heavy rains, it is there in Japan where there's earthquake. So it's there in Ladakh, Leh and Ladakh and uh, Himalayas, all the monasteries, most of the mon monasteries are done with mud and uh, timber and stones. So there is, it's, it's spread all over the world, you know, you, you can find uh, mud is used very effectively. A simple, simple way to sort of have mud building system sort of have, uh, have protected from rain or uh, all this natural forces, that's it. So it's not a big deal. You can build it if you use common sense. Common sense is not that common also. But all what you can do is uh, to, to, to make it, uh, to, to make the earth, uh, you know, you keep, keep rains or some damaging things away from it. You give sufficient overhang or sufficient uh, protection to keep it uh, well. You, know, you have more than 100 years old buildings made with mud, even in, in, in coastal areas of, uh, or western uh, gardens. So that is one thing. So the next question was like uh, that you know, about biodiversity includes this uh, Development, like the landscape. I, I normally landscape. what I do is I don't, uh, I don't take plants from outside. I, I, I keep my plant selection from the local area. I just pick up what is uh, locally available, what can go without pesticide, <coughs> what is loved by the birds. I feel that I want to improve the quality of, uh, you know, to improve. To bring in more butterflies, I, I go over for choose my plants, nectar plants, for feeding them and host plants. Butterflies require hosting plants. You know, they host on plants. They build their uh, systems in plants so that the, the larvae, the, the system feeds on the leaves. And uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a cycle which was all together well within that. So that way, uh, because we can have, we have a lot of choices, and that choices choice should be from the local area. That will make it comfortable, so that you don't have to sort of use, to, you don't have to give too much of care. You can actually, if you pick up plants from the local area, you actually it will grow by itself. You don't have to give uh, anything. It will take care by itself. You don't have to give water. You don't have to. It will work out by itself. So that is the kind of thing. And if the, the birds, everything, everyone will feel native. They will feel comfortable because they they know everything. They know the they know others who are standing beside them. That's the philosophy that I use. Thank you, sir. Um, now we have uh, the questions from the next group. Uh, group three. You can ask your question. Yeah. Good evening, sir. I am Katpagam from fifth year. So my question is about your project Bodhi House. 
So I want to ask you, when you started to experiment with MUT architecture, was it already prevalent? And how was the client base? Like you have to convince them about the style of architecture. And in the mm -hmm. Nippon skin roof technique, uh, the ferro cement rafters are being used. So I would like to know the process and the placement of the precast roof. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, we have another question uh, okay. regarding the same project. So the maintenance uh, of mud houses pose an issue for the people. Like for example, in the case of rains. So how do you uh, solve this problem and gain confidence uh, from your clients? Yeah, so I'll start with the question, Bodhi. Uh, Bodhi, you know, I built it in 96. In 96. In fact, uh, I started my practice in, in my hometown in 85. You know, I, I, I started the second college and uh, I started my practice there. And fortunately, I got some major projects and I, I was quite popular in the city. And uh, one person, one client uh, came. Uh, I was, I, I mean, in fact, I was, I had this uh, dream of building a house made with mud. And... Uh, but unfortunately, I was not, uh, you know, I didn't get a client who could help me out, uh, you know, to realize my dream. And, but I used to shamelessly ask who was coming to me that, you know, shall we build with Martin? And this person who is a naturist, he's, by, he's a, he, he retired as IAS officer in the state government. His wife was a professor in the college uh, close by. <laughs> so they agreed. And I said, Mud, they agreed. So I was surprised. So I was excited. And uh, they started uh, with my, uh, eight, you know, dream build it. Way back in 96. So you can imagine. In fact, uh, I don't I don't claim that I did the mud house, uh, the, the house, mud house which is very unique. You know, right? Because in Koinon, the place where I live, and in Kerala also, we had uh, so many mud houses that all the, almost all the traditional buildings had ma major portion of it filled with mud, with mud and uh, local stones, and in some cases just with mud. The foundations were made with mud or with local stones, that means lad straight. And the walls and verandas, everything was built with mud, beautiful, you know, and light washed. And there were some beautiful palatial buildings, you know, really, which looks very uh, glory. I mean, very, you know, beautiful with cornices and so on, made with mud and lime plaster. They make, they used to make houses with mud blocks. That is the uh, sun-dried mud blocks, adobe, and plaster it with lime and uh, then do the work of moldings and uh, all the finishations, details and all that. So, but that is uh, that was not way back, and uh, people this mud structure means if you if you if you live in a mud structure which is uh, exposed or something, then uh, people have a uh, wrong uh, idea about it because they say that living in a mud house is not uh, you know suitable for it's not dignifying you know to 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 live in a mud structure and so on. So, um, this was uh, not an experiment for me because I have already had done a lot of research on my work. So, this is, a, this is my first project. I did it. Uh, you could see the fenestrations. And uh, I, uh, in fact, before this uh, structure, I was uh, influenced by Laurie Baker and was building structures with, with uh, you know, bricks. I'll show you. Um, I was building structures like that before this, like you know, using you know, highly influenced by backup and but using still different by using natural stones and uh, most of it, but using exposed brick in a very large way. So. Um, Bodhi was a, was, a, was a good good opening for me because I I, I wanted to do, I mean use the full potential 
live going away from set quay designs to you know forms which is so organic and uh, so it it's just like a, a natural thing being in the nature it's not like a, a, a squareish block kind of structure so it really gives a different i mean ambience inside to making it uh, you know so different and comfortable for us and it it's so soothing and uh, the, the 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 but my clients you know they still enjoy the house a lot unfortunately you know I, th- those days i didn't have a good structural designer he, i mean i approached the structural designer who used to make buildings for me so he said uh, sorry eugene i don't he, professor he said professor I mean, a colleague of mine who was uh, working in the civil department in the same college where i was uh, heading the architecture department so he said you know sorry eugene i can't help you because i i, I don't know anything about mud uh, stability of mud and the kind of roof i am talking about <coughs> so i had to go back and dig all my old books and do much more research and uh, got confidence to do the structure myself and now even now i do my structures myself i mean structure i feel structural design is very important for architect you know don't don't take it so lightly uh, because structural if you want to be creative because you know architect the uh, structural engineers they they can give you only solutions which for which they have code i hope you understand you know for concrete they have code for mud they don't have code if you may, if you want to make a creative roof like that you know the complex roof they don't have solution so i had to sort of sit and work out a new system of roof this is a totally new system of roof which i developed it's called i call it as a ribbon skin roof say uh, i got inspiration from the traditional roof of uh, of uh, or uh, radiating rafters of timber houses and these ferro cement uh, rafters uh, were uh, done on the ground the, the i had a simple uh, specification that means that the rafter should be we should, two people should be able to lift the rafter and place it in position it should be less than and we i we could join you know lengthy i mean if you want to make this a length we could well join it it's a simple kind of a system uh, ra- i mean raft uh, made like uh, rafters of uh, timber houses and uh, uh, that's a rib and the skin is just a ferro cement skin so it does well even now six means like 25 it's almost uh, 20 24 years right it is it, it still stays without any problem so that is it um, so gave sufficient overhang if you look at the buildings you can see that there's sufficient overhang around so it doesn't uh, make the walls wet and uh, i stabilized the uh, mud also by using 5% just to mud and uh, in fact this was left this structure was left open to the to the nature for about 2 years harsh uh, monsoons two two monsoons nothing happened the structure and uh, my clients are more confident than me the kind of thing. you can see the fenestration how it works and it's a, it's a highly you can see the holes you know that this holes on the high uh, the, the the topmost point was for passive cooling the entire uh, system of natural uh, stack effect was used in, to to manage the hot air like these all this Uh, penetrations were worked with their purpose it's a totally insect free house this is a kind of lamp and shade the furniture everything was made with them. even the bed was made with the mud so it was lot there was a lot of fun you know doing it i i still enjoy i remember you know how i enjoyed doing that yeah. thank you sir i think the fun is very obvious in the design uh, okay so uh, we will go to the next uh, question yeah team four yeah prathna uh, yes sir uh, good evening sir my name is prathna i am from fifth year uh, actually i have to apologize from because the, there's a bad connection from my side uh, so <laughs> going forward um, i have three questions uh, so the first one is the resort is sandwiched between the backwaters and the city you know, kolam city so 
my the project i'm talk, talking about is the ravi's in kolam the ravi's rashtra movie so it has 90 rooms suite rooms and cot and private cottages and villas so in total it has 2 lakh square feet of floor area so how did you manage to fit all that and as a follow up how did you manage to design and optimize the landscaping for the whole campus and my third question is there's a lot of variety in the style of the building as well as the interior design for all the rooms how did you enable the transition between the various styles in the buildings and the rooms thank you thank you pratna uh, sir yo that's it sir any more question no only one question that's about it yeah that's all sir yeah. see ra ravis is uh, is located in in it's very close to my house and it's about uh, 200 meters from my house this can walk to that place it's so beautiful location and uh, uh, it's a very historically important location very in fact kollam is the ancient port town you know it is a part of the silk road Uh, ancient silk roads, and uh, we had uh, the Portuguese, the the Dutch, English, and the Venard kingdoms. You know, like the the Kuala Varsham, the 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 calendar that we use throughout. You know, in your place and in my place and all over in the south is uh, Kuala. Kuala is Kuala. You know, that my hometown. So it's a very important historical location and. Uh, so uh, there is lot of biodiversity uh, if you look if you google kolam you will know that uh, this uh, is a river basin there's a river which flows to this uh, area and uh, the the this is a backwater in which this property is there. so it's a, it's called, also called a lake ashtamudi or uh, a estuary of uh, estuary ashtamudi and uh, backwater and all that anyway so i it was an opportunity for me to study the the, the heritage cultural heritage that we imbibe from the portuguese the dutch and the english you know? and also the ancient uh, architecture that we had here so uh, that was an amazing uh, feat to go through the history and understand architecture and the cultural contributions that made uh, uh, and that was available for me to sort of work out a palette to build. and also uh, i wanted to give a journey to the cultural and natural heritage of this region this cultural heritage actually imbibes all this uh, uh, architecture of uh, different periods and the natural heritage is uh, is, a, is a kind of landscape and the biodiversity that's there in the in the plants and uh, flora and fauna of this area so so that's it so that way i um, i was careful about uh, you know limiting the project and not making it too uh, you know heavy and uh, making it comfortable for everything to sit well together and this 2 lakh square feet i am not sure how much whether it is 2 lakh or not but uh, we of course even if it is 2 lakh it just it sits comfortably and the landscape was also done by me in fact this property i don't have the earliest slide before we started doing the project to the boat building yard it was very horrible you know there's nothing there and uh, it took pretty long time to finish the project i started this project in 2000 and uh, it was completed in 2011 it was inaugurated by shahrukh khan so um, so but you know all this 11 years i i had uh, with me to sort of build up the landscape so each and every plant you know it was picked up and uh, planted the same philosophy i use everywhere to encourage uh, you know the birds and all the kind of living organisms even the this i'll take you to the uh, some slides which i thought to spare is not there yeah let to put those ones yeah
yeah yeah in the the coastal you know coastal uh, you know the water and the land interface was built such that uh, that i accommodated the biodiversity to sort of sit inside and uh, make uh, in breeding ground for fishes and for crabs and other kind of i don't have the slides to show you unfortunately so i think i that's not there <laughs> yeah um so that's it thank yeah thank you sir i think that answers your question prathna uh, i think we will go on to the next uh, set of questions good evening sir uh, this is silan talaiban uh, from final year again uh, my question is about uh, your uh, suran not project uh, the age of the house is mentioned 300 years old what was the condition of the timber used since it is a timber house if some were found not applicable for the purpose it was serving before were they reused for some other purposes during renovation adding up to that did they opt locally available materials for construction 300 years ago or they opted materials from distant sources if from a distant source how far is it from the location of the house thank you sir uh, thank you lenta levan i think we have a, a additional question on the same project um in here Inial, you can ask a question. Um, Ilendalan, you have the additional question with you. Yes, sir. I have the question. Yeah, I will ask. Can you just ask yes. that also? Yeah. 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 The second question is: uh, any significant difference in architectural style of Kerala 300 years before that you can share with us? If so, have you tried implementing it in any of your projects? Thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See, uh, I'll tell you the. Uh, this is Suranad uh, house that you're talking about. This is in Kerala. We had uh, two, three typologies. One is the uh, people who could afford timber houses. They build houses like that, you know, using timber. And uh, there's also another project which is uh, as old, um, the Nattilam. This is also a timber house. Uh, before conservation, before yeah, before interventions. Now it used to be like that, you know, like timber structures, the walls, and the, there's no foundation. Basically, you we make the foundation with stones or stone. I mean, with mud. and have a beam which goes around typically a beam going around to accommodate to to support the uh, wall and the roof with the rafters like so this is a old this is a old house you know which uh, that was also renovated uh, i mean to stop so this is in kerala you know you said we have a, have a tropical climate uh, tropical rain forest kind of a situation all these places where a uh, thickly dense for forest and uh, we had lots of trees around you know? so but uh, it was not affordable for everyone to sort of uh, hire carpenters and uh, force them to build houses so the building materials that was used by you know people who could afford or rich the up the rich people could make houses and you know make really ornate kind of uh ceiling and the walls and uh, with mud but it was not usable in today's context because the height those days they the height of the building was only just uh, it was just option for people to sort of go in you know by bending your head and going inside usually if you go to a old building the old building is where nothing is done before you are likely to hit your head and you like it injure your head so uh, the there was a problem uh, a couple of problems only otherwise the the houses were good so uh, the ro- rooms were small there was no washrooms inside the houses there was no the height is a major problem we couldn't even install a fan so what i did is they were using it as their house only but uh, for generations for three four generations they were using it and uh, now when it when it comes 
to today's terms, it was not usable. So they they approached me and asked me whether I could uh, modify it. They do what they asked me for my opinion whether they can keep this or make a new building and all this. I said you can keep this building and we could accommodate all this, uh, all their needs and uh, increase the height and make uh, they were all tiny rooms which uh, we could tweak and uh, join to put two or three rooms together to make make a larger space and so on so this is a nalikat nalikat means it has a courtyard inside and uh, it is a typology early typology so we used jacks and uh, lifted the house by about 45 cm and uh, made some tweaking you know the tile roof Early it was thatch, and uh, only about uh, 40, 50 years back they made converted that to uh, mango tiles. But I made added another layer between that to make it uh, even comfortable, such that uh, there is uh, they don't have to worry about it when when it rains also that way. So this, this was a uh, it's not the adaptive reuse, but it's a reuse of the same building by. Uh, by restructuring it and retrofitting it and you know re rescaling it that yes i mean th yeah this is a better example of that uh, this one which i can this is tenet tenatilla it is a house with two courtyards all partially made with timber and partially made with uh, laterite and stones and this is a kind of, uh, I mean, open to sky uh, washrooms which I gave so that they can, they, there was no washrooms for the old houses. People used to go to the to the to their uh, property outside for their needs, and uh, so this, this was amazing because you could get out into the to the open and uh, enjoy the rains and uh, get sunlight and like so. They are, they, I mean. It's like it, I showed the old picture also, I suppose. I'll show you the old picture before intervention, it was like, like that. So, it was increased, the height was increased by about 45 centimeters. These are the courtyards. This was the roof, no? Like, uh, so I, I modified the roof by adding a layer. And you could see the kitchen. This was also a problem. The kitchen, they had this kind of old kitchen, like what we used to have earlier, and uh, they they wanted to modernize it. And intervention process was something like you know, high, increase the height and putting sheet on top of it. The walls, we used jack to lift it up, and that gave us this kind of. This is a courtyard that we transformed it to, and we put oxide as a flooring material. It's the same thing, like, you know, increasing the size by adding two, two or three rooms and putting it together and adding more, more larger windows and uh, adding fenestrations to it, making it more uh, meaningful. Right. So what is the next question that is that, uh, I, did I answer all the the, made or yes, sir. I think uh, the additional question was uh, a 300 years old building. What architectural style was did you, uh, I think, reuse? What no, kind no, of it's style? Same, same years style. I, I, I used the same. I used the same. I didn't alter the style. I just yeah. worked within the same vocabulary. Yeah, that is the thing. I don't change it much. Same vocabulary that we had earlier. So uh, when we do restoration and conservation projects, we have to be very careful that not altering the vocabulary and uh, things. But see, the kitchen, kitchen we had to make changes. We made it. That's why it's not looking awkward. No, like it 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 fits, fits suitably well with the kind of. It's not that new, that too modern, or it's not that old, but very functional. In the washrooms also, like you, you need to have modern uh, systems because people won't. If you ask them to squat down, squat down and use the Indian toilet, most of uh, today's, I mean, like the old people, may, they may not find it comfortable to do that. You know? okay. So all this new uh, washrooms and all that, we have to 
can't be uh, so fanatic about the old things but most of the things we can change but use the same vocabulary and uh, not uh, altering it that drastically but making it comfortable and the overall look and feel of the certain structure should be well within the kind of style yeah, yeah. in short like you uh, kept the soul of the building as it was Exactly, exactly. You said it right. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I think we'll go on to the next set of questions. This is the last uh, set as when it comes to the discussion with our MIDA students. So we'll. Can we have the questions, please? Good evening, sir. This is Adra <coughs> Naya from fifth year as well. So my question is a very general question, sir. So this dream of building mud houses came to you in the year nineteen eighty one. but you were able to actually fulfill it in 1996 with bodhi house so it is a it is indeed a huge gap so what kept your dream alive and in today's scenario if an architect is looking at the world from your perspective how long do you think it will take for them to pursue their goals thank you sir thank you we have one more question related to the same general section yes namaskaram sir Uh, my question is here from your point of view how will you differentiate the sustainable vernacular and resilient architecture in the present day context thank you sir thank you abhishek the so, last this question sustainable uh, what is the sustainable vernacular and what you and resilient sustainable resilient yeah see all all uh, traditional buildings all this heritage structures when i look at it they are all sustainable at first point they can i mean this uh, new uh, if you with the if you match with the new certification guidelines it is all 100% or much more than that so it doesn't use resources which are uh, dangerous to or which are alien and uh, it's made from local materials within that location it's all it's so i mean it's so i mean the nature finds it so comfortable and so all the heritage structures that you find is all uh, vernacular heritage structures that you find i i don't call only palatial buildings as heritage but i also co- consider the tribal the house habitats of tribals also is a her- it's also a heritage architecture unfortunately in colleges we don't give much of emphasis for that we we only go for monumental buildings and college heritage but non monumental buildings like even buildings that we make or I mean we have it now village had it now village in history of architecture unfortunately we only touch the monuments you know all that buildings which are talked about as a, as a heritage but a lot of technologies which we have to study from the heritage structure unfortunately in college when we are talking we are studying history nothing is told about the technology that is uh, applicable you know in those those buildings there every village in a, in a country like you have india is a, more than it is uh, i mean we we that was about 500 uh, princely kingdoms we brought together to form our country and every every place had its own kind of unique architecture technology and uh, goodness in various even in you know in uh, food and clothing and craft and everything if you look at the cultural aspect of everything you find you can find a lot of such uh, interesting things and we can put together and so it's it's a it's a amazing thing that you can you will get from if you if you, go, if you go deeper into the heritage of every so <coughs> so the new ones that we make now is is totally uh, is we have to look into it because you know we have we we only know to make buildings with concrete and steel and some people you know like uh, modern architects they they know only to build with concrete they make huge buildings like uh, river banks are constructed with the uh, concrete retaining walls you know it disconnects the nature the the bank and the water the, na- the 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 land and the water is disconnected by you putting concrete walls you know and uh, those kind of things there's a lot to talk about it if you, if you look at it in a critical way so uh, you can you can consider that everything that you have traditionally is all 100% sustainable you can copy that 
we can use those as the codes, safe codes to build sustainable architecture. You don't go for gray, you don't have to go for this foolish uh, certification, which is I call it foolish or you know absurd and to most of the ninety percent population. Maybe the rich can go for it and uh, they can keep them occupied. And uh, regarding uh, the streams of uh, of my, you know, you have to pursue your dreams. I don't know how long it will take. Sometimes it may not uh, work out also, but if you're fortunate, it will work out. I uh, I had to wait for a long time to sort of uh, <coughs> do this kind of uh, work which I loved. So it, it all, I don't know how how long you have to wait, but you have to have that kind of motivation and, uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, I was lucky to get a client eventually, only mm. after doing the first building, people got convinced. This is the second house I made in Koyla, after the first two. The building, has, I mean, this we built in 2000, I think. And there are more buildings which we did that, like that. Um, OBM. This is an amazing structure which, which I got uh, an opportunity to build in nature, either natural, whatever we picked up things from the local and uh, this is uh, artist. Uh, village. I mean, it's, uh, it, they had about seven acres of property and they wanted a very small, meaningful footprint to build, a, to accommodate themselves. And, uh, it's all local stones and materials. That, a lot of fun. So, uh, I hope I have answered that question. Yes. Also, if, if, if I'm not, yeah. I think you've answered it, sir. I think, uh, Adira, you must be happy with the answer. Uh, Justin, in addition to that, I think yes, I've read sir. somewhere that anyone who has a why will definitely have a how oh, and a when. <laughs> so, uh, I think with this, we can uh, conclude the discussion and uh, we are open to questions. So, um, I would like to now take up questions uh, from the audience. So, all you have to do is there is a raise your hand button. So you could uh, just press that button and we will uh, get to you. So there's the raise your hand button. The show conversation is a little more difficult for us to get to now. Uh, just press the raise your hand button and we will uh, call out your name. When your name is called out, unmute yourself and ask the question. And a general instruction, please keep your questions uh, as brief as possible so that we can accommodate as many questions as possible also. Thank you. So. Uh, Uh, do we have questions now? Uh, questions? Uh, yes. uh, Arad yes. Tiwari, yeah. I've raised the yes. right. Yes. Uh, Mr. Arad Tiwari, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, good evening all. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just uh, want to ask uh, about the structure which was showing uh, in this uh, conversation from Kerala. Uh, which one particularly, ma'am? The... Yeah, no, the, it was a kind Rest of a guest in... house, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. There were... uh, so my question was, yeah. What all kind of difficulties were faced uh, during its uh, foundation structure by the masons as it is uh, situated at um, in between uh, backwaters? So the soil must be uh, not that much uh, uh, strong enough to hold the structure. Uh, okay. I think uh, the question uh, refers to the Raviz Astamudi, sir. Oh, I think so. I'm not sure, but something related to backwater. So I'm assuming it's that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have to take care of the foundation uh, by calculating and finding out what uh, 
We are talking about uh, Ravis. I'll just go to that Ravis. Yeah, this project is it? Yeah, the down is firm. There is no problem as far as the the foundations were concerned. We do a proper study of the soil, and then only we do this structure. Yeah. Okay. Wherever uh, we hope... have, if you are having in, yeah, if it's a lighter location like Kutunad, where it's fully clay, we go for lighter structures. If you don't want to spend too much of money, otherwise, let's go for pile foundation. So it depends on the kind of project that we do, the kind of weight that we we put in there. So right. you can have lighter structures like uh, the soil is very loose and uh, the structure is very very small. It's sensible to make a lighter structure. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. I, uh, the next question is from Shruti. Shruti, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, yeah. Good evening, all. Uh, I'm an architect by profession and practicing in Aurangabad, Maharashtra. Uh, uh, seeing this all uh, traditional architecture, one thing came into my mind that uh, in mud construction, how concealed electrification is possible? Is it possible, or uh, like how we can go forward with it? Yeah, yeah, you can do. Uh, you can do concealed uh, wiring, concealed plumbing. Everything is possible. Okay, uh, because uh, uh, some in some of the images I saw the wires uh, which were op open, and uh, so that's where like. Uh, yeah, you can make uh, open and uh, concealed. You no, know, we have in this project. I use concealed. Until the uh, electric lights, but this uh, hanging things are uh, wires, but uh, all the other wires are all concealed. You can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shruti. Do you have another any other questions? Uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Please ask yeah. your question. Uh, um, so my name is Harish Sri. I'm studying third year architecture. Yes. Uh, uh, sir, in your uh, pro I mean, most of your projects are based on local materials. So, can you explain? I mean, in this modern world, we use uh, glass, steel, concrete, and we consider it strong and it's important. So, sir, can you explain the importance of local materials? I mean, using it about. Yeah. Uh, see, steel, concrete is very common, and uh, we know uh, that because we use that. We are taught to deal with that. So we have, uh, I mean, we have a lot of tradition of building with local materials, and there is no need to build with uh, concrete and steel. You know, we can use. I don't, I don't say that uh, we should avoid concrete and steel, but we can use it, but don't abuse it. So, for example, in mud structure that I have shown you, I have used uh, uh, concrete in a very light way. Say, especially for the dam proofing, I use uh, a small, thin uh, DPC with steel and concrete to avoid unequal settlement. And many premises I use it, but because you know I don't have hatred for any material. You know, this, I don't know whether you've heard about this new material called uh, uh, graphene. Which is uh, going to be the uh, supposedly going to be uh, very versatile to do lots of things, and it's, it's a graphite-based material called graphene. With one ounce, you can cover two two acres of land. One ounce, one ounce of material, and it's so powerful. It's very uh, amazing material to take care of tensile strength. It can hang a grand piano. I mean, the size of your hair. If you take graphene. Which, suit, which is equal to your hair, you can hang a grand piano, that kind of tensile strength it, it has. It's just uh, talked about, you know, it's not come to the market yet. I'm waiting, you know, to explore that. So don't feel bad about in using any material, but, you know, you have to see what is the appropriate material for a region. If, if uh, you get something local, if it is available. See, I don't. I I've, I've made. I make buildings with many materials. Like I don't make just. I just don't just make buildings with mud. I make with whatever is available. In one place, I had to do a building with rock stones because only stone was available there. Stone and mud was used there. 
like so so wherever you whatever you have uh, you know in the surrounding area and whatever is traditionally used for making houses it's appropriate to use that so glass thank you sir hey i usually suppose glass you know for example glass in certain places where you have very hot climate you need or if it is extreme so very cold you have to use that in places like uh, in kerala where you don't the the temperature doesn't go beyond uh, 35 or uh, it doesn't come below 18 or so you don't have to use glass you know you can use uh, there are mesh which you can use instead of glass to keep insects outside so that way i use that i use i use glass plus i use mesh i use mesh to take care of passive to 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 for passive cooling so you have to use your wisdom to to use the appropriate material concrete using concrete uh, is one thing where you you have to think about the resources that it it, it, it exploits like you know the the rural sand is square to make concrete and and uh, lime if it is available is the best it's much better than <coughs> cement Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we have a question from Inial. Inial, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good evening, sir. I'm Inial, final year student from Madras, sir. So my question is: People call uh, present day cities as concrete jungle. Uh, so what is your subjective perception about people calling cities like this? And any kind of opting concrete structures, finally, sir. In nutshell, what is the scope of sustainability in urban design? yeah sustainability is possible everywhere uh, it's not only in, a, uh, in villages but in urban area also is possible when you the thing is that we have we have to make abodes we have to make houses and to to accommodate ourselves it can be made uh, using sustainable practices and ways you know like uh, you don't have to go for concrete and steel to make buildings if you see the ancient uh, not very ancient but this industrial towns which were made in europe and all that most of them are sustainable it's, uh, and uh, i don't think uh, they have used too much of concrete in that at least in most of the uh, structures which were made uh, traditionally uh, during the time of industrial revolution before they started using cement and concrete to build multi storied structures you know so high density structures are possible say shahnabad in delhi that is a uh, you know 1000 persons per acre this uh, is a is, that was the kind of density that we could achieve by using natural materials and lime and so on. there's no concrete involved in but it's all i don't say that uh, we shouldn't make multi storied right i i always uh, think that we can think about multi storied buildings because you know we erased lot of uh, natural heritage when we spread out ourselves we we erase the biodiversity and natural heritage when we build horizontally i always think that uh, but going vertical is uh, more uh, sensible to take care of the destroyed uh, to take care of the biodiversity so now uh, you can see many designs Uh, evolved designs which uh, which accommodate uh, sustainability in a very large uh, way they uh, managing the waste water and uh, having you know vegetation along with the structure and using cultivating and having vertical garden then like so a lot of examples uh, how people have uh, used vegetative facades and uh, biofencing and lots of solutions which are the uh, common sense based solutions for sustainability okay. thank you sir thank uh, you sir thank you uh, now we have a question from abirami abirami you can unmute yourself and ask the question yes sir hi sir so uh, it was a great session sir so uh, my question is uh, slightly related to the previous question uh, you you told that you waited for the right client for uh, choosing mud houses so what do you think uh, makes people to choose concrete over 
smart houses is there any specific reason like budget wise or uh, the look or height restrictions is there anything specific that they choose concrete buildings no i don't think uh, we should put the blame on people it's a blame that we should take but because you know architects and engineers know only to build the new architects and engineers know only to build with concrete and uh, mm-hmm. what i say i put the blame on us including me like uh, we are comfortable with that we don't we can't take risk we don't know so we make uh, see how many of us know new <coughs> when we were in college to build uh, with something other than cement and steel or the we had a, a typical uh, specification to show the foundation just we started the 3 feet by 3 feet minimum 3 feet by 3 feet pit in which we lay about 6 uh, thick uh, pcc plain cement concrete one bag of cement with uh, four bags of reverse sand and eight bag of concrete uh, crushed stones like so so that specification starts like that with cement cement mortar and uh, stones and uh, bricks and cement mortar and we don't know anything we have not used anything other than that you know we have we are not used to building <coughs> differently <coughs> and so so we can only offer that to the clients so if you offer better things to the clients they will be uh, i think you'll get you know because i i get lots of clients from various parts of the country and from outside also and they they request me to make houses but i try do it possible wherever it's possible but you know uh, this kind of things requires some uh, Uh, preference also but nowadays it is possible by i'm actually handling projects in different fields by use, using uh, whatsapp and whatsapp video calls and so on so i'm helping them earlier i had to go like my projects in rajasthan and all that i had to make very frequent visits earlier but nowadays i give very detailed drawings and i don't have to go there because i uh, use this modern systems like they can call me from the site by using whatsapp and we uh, i can see what that video and they they get telling the problems that they have you know, to move forward and, uh, i help them out like so that so it's, uh, it's always uh, easy in today's context it's, it's easy to share knowledge it's easy to to help uh, remote uh, management like we do it you now like we are we are quite a n- good number of people you know sitting together and uh, sharing our ideas and uh, sharing our knowledge so it's a very good way of doing it if i were to come to midas uh, i would have lost 3 days you know like traveling from here and being coming to thing and staying in a hotel and, and so it's possible to share technology across a lot of technologies are available traditional technologies and uh, because people can share it we can learn we can also try it experiment with that go to hands on with that and uh, do you can try out uh, different from concrete and steel that we have in fact bamboo can be substituted um, i mean can be a good substitution for steel is as good as steel there are bamboo varieties which are called vegetable steel like uh, the bamboo varieties uh, like gua dua it's, it's it's called equivalent to it's called a vegetable steel so that kind of thing lot of information is available you know, if you are if you are keen to do this, this kind of structures and all that you can you are uh, materials are available now resources okay. are there and uh, it's great yeah. yes uh thank you sir i hope that answers your question uh, next we had a question from mr guru if you are still there could you ask your question I think we've lost him. Uh, Adira has a question now. Adira? Yes, sir. hello sir. So I had one more question. Uh, hailing from a place like Kerala where a major portion of breadwinners work at UAE, so when they return their prime aim is to have a house which is pretty luxurious. For them house is not just a shelter but it's also a symbol of their status. So is a good uh, proportion of this population opting for mud houses or is there a gap? So if if yes how do we bridge that gap sir In fact uh, this is a very good question because i get lots of uh, nras especially from gulf and people who are abroad wanting to build with mud 
Unfortunately, I don't have a mechan- machine- machinery to build houses. I just give designs and technology. So there is a lot of scope for, you know, if somebody who can build hands-on with mud. There's a lot of scope. A lot of people from the Middle East and in Gulf, from Gulf region, call me regularly also. In the middle of the night also, they call me and say, I want to protect a cost-effective night house like what you uh, do and all that. So I am enthusiastic by all this kind of uh, requirements, but I I don't have that kind of machinery to sort of uh, you know to provide them. They want houses to be built and given to them, which uh, for which I don't have uh, system. <coughs> so <clears throat> what I am saying is that there are a lot of takers for it. Now in today's context, there are a lot of takers. There are many people because if you build nicely, beautifully. It's better than sensible than the other structures, and if it's more comfortable, there's no sense to what well, only senses sense people with senses they go for this kind of sustainable structures. A lot of people, a lot of uh, you know, people who even work uh, on uh, you know, down to earth people who have who sustain their daily resources, they also want to do something like that. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Adira. Yes, thank sir. You. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we had a question from Mr. Guru. If he's still there, he can ask the question. Okay. Um, any more questions? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes. Hello, uh, sir. Hi, sir. This uh, is Arshia. Yeah, one, uh, one second. Is that Mr. Guru? No. Could you just ask your question first? Then Anusha. Uh, my question, my question was that uh, can we use mud as a material in flood resistant and cyclone cyclone resistant buildings? Okay, sir. Cyclone, cyclone, and what else do you say? Flood resistant. Flood. Flood. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have to take care. Say if you are in a, a flood. A flood prone area, you have to take care. It's foolish to then build, in a, build a building, any building, even concrete buildings in an area which is prone to flood. I don't recommend that. You know, don't, there are no places uh, where if you have flood means like you have to find, seek a location which is not flooded. Even if you are making a concrete structure, that, that, that is a kind of I mean, experience that we've had because of the last to flood, you know. So uh, it's better that you don't build, don't try to uh, challenge or compete with nature. But in in places where you have cyclones, I've seen lots of structures which are in the coastal areas where the frequent uh, cyclones happening. They put a uh, very low roof and so that the wind doesn't catch. And also the eaves, you know, the eaves which overhang beyond the walls, they, that is done in a very loose manner. So that you know, if the wind uh, wind lifts, tries to lift it up, it works like a skirt worn by uh, girls, you know, like or any like a mundu. So it lifts it up and uh, it it doesn't resist, but it just lifts up and uh, allow the air to go pass through without destroying the structure. And uh, traditionally, we used to use thatch. Thatch used to behave very well in cyclone prone area where the thatch used to lift up by itself and the wind used to go and uh, later on we started using tile and what happens that the i'm talking about the area which is which which, which uh, is can delivered from the wall to the outside the eave portion of the the roof which we use for protecting the wall so that uh, when you put tiles what happens is that the wind will lift up the the tiles and the tiles are flown away so but it doesn't affect the structure much so we have ways and means to do uh, take care of all this kind of wind, and also we can use landscape uh, systems to landscape systems by uh, you know configuring the land in such a way that the wind is not uh, affecting the structure, or by planting more trees you can block the wind. Appropriate trees, appropriate trees, trees and shrubs to 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 you know redirect the wind to in, in, in a different way and so on. So there are ways and means of doing it. But in flood areas, you have a lot. It's risky to sort of 
provide in a place where this land landslide and uh, floods okay right. sir, thank, uh, you. thank you sir i think the next question anusha if i got your name right hello sir yes yes you can ask your question hello sir thanks for yes. the impact yes sir my question is that sir as we are completely focused on the concept of sustainable architecture since it is the face of the future my question is that if cement concrete aggregate etc like conventional be- buildings are being stopped are we able to get the raw materials and resources abundantly to apply sustainable architecture everywhere widely this is my question sir thank you anusha no, no i don't ask you to stop all this uh, cement steel uh, aggregates and all that but we have to use it uh, with, with with care we don't we don't abuse it it is not required for many purpose we use it where it is not required i've seen uh, buildings the whole buildings made with concrete um, in gujarat i have seen so many buildings like important public buildings are made with concrete that's concrete you know the walls 12 cm thick walls where you don't need one one inch thick wall especially institution buildings where you don't have to build uh, use concrete and steel but we use it we use that means that it, it also it is consuming a lot of the sand and uh, steel and unnecessarily so we need we can we have to use it we can use it we can reuse it we should also have the habit of i mean we should also have the have the technology of reusing resources so waste is not a waste waste is not a waste waste is a resource that is the new consideration that we have to give all waste right. have to be considered as a resource and even human waste is considered as a resource in us they they have uh, found out ways of extracting rare metals from human uh, waste right uh, thank you sir Uh, i think uh, we'll end with next two questions uh, we'll have a next question from abhishek abhishek sir yeah good evening sir sir i would love to ask this question yes. after seeing all this uh, i have seen most of your buildings in this website sir, recently so like i you know all those buildings uh, those buildings really blended into the nature very well like my question is what is that secret ingredient or what the secret you use to make all your buildings evolve from earth like it's been created by the earth itself very touching question <laughs> see uh, see i mean it it i i love uh, you know i love nature i just love nature I, and i think um, uh, i i don't think that uh, we should strictly work the you know this kind of square and t square kind of thing we have to we can we have freedom to sort of move away from it and to go with nature because if you look at nature you don't find any straight lines and everything blends well with other geometry is so soothing to the eye <coughs> nothing is rigid so space is also flow from one space to another and it, it goes well so that way uh, so i am very particular about you know uh, some form of uh, getting close to nature that is what i love so i get involved with to, to produce something which sits nicely and also the landscape forms a magic with my structures too landscape in the sense that uh, that will help to cover most of our faults also i hope you know understand that if you have a bad building the best way to do is to to trees all around <laughs> make it look nice so nature will take care of it if you leave a poor building if you build a, if you make a building and if it looks horrible just try to put something on top of it so that it grows and covers it blends nicely with nature that's it so i'm i'm not saying that i'm making bad buildings and just landscaping it and covering it up but that's also a way of doing it so nature can do a lot of wonders yeah yeah thank you sir thank you sir i think the secret is out now uh, i think the next question from karpagam <laughs> yeah so i have two questions 
So the one is there's the concept of mud architecture. Follow any building codes. Like as we're just stepping into the field, is there any regulation regarding uh, this mud architecture and that we have to follow? And my second question would be with the COVID-19 uh, situation on rise, do you think the architecture post pandemic should be changed consciously? What is your vision? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, see, one is that uh, mud, uh, as such, there is no uh, restriction to make with mud. Nobody says that you, can't, you have to build with that, this and all that. So building courts, there is nothing which provides you to build also with mud, but you can use it. I don't have a problem in the first building, Bodhi, when I made the bank, the bank people, they refused to give loan to my client. <laughs> then I had, a, I had to fight with the bank people because they are taking interest. They, they are just my clients are borrowing the money and uh, they are uh, paying interest for it, and they have no business to enter in, in, to look into the the technology that we use. And I am a qualified architect. I have registered the Council of Architecture. I have, I have all the freedom to do whatever I want in the sense to make it safer. <coughs> just none of their business to come into and ask say that uh, I should build only with this and all this. So with my argument, which went on very well. And I was also doing major projects, you know, with, uh, with the huge proportion and state at that time. And I was also holding a responsible position and like so I, I managed to get through. And I don't think there is any problem if you pursue your... Because uh, local authorities also can't say that you can't... They, it's a, unfortunately, all the old structures are called as kacha buildings by town planning department. I've been fighting with them and I've been telling them it's a foolish thing to call four buildings, kacha buildings, pakka buildings and kacha buildings. All concrete buildings are called pakka building and uh, uh, this old structures are called tile roof buildings are called kacha. It gives the wrong notion of the whole thing. Because tile buildings, buildings are also pakka. But the technology is different. So, uh, you know, this uh, 1960s onwards, we had this problem. Concrete and uh, the new age teaching technology and uh, and what we uh, what we are used to. When I, I when I was studying, I was also trained to use box like structures. You know, or uh, masters, late masters, the uh, cobbles here and fell right and uh, uh, people like that. And uh, we got exposure from Gaudi and Baker and Fatte and all that. Later, much later, but we uh, we went more rationally to understand more more about different type of typologies and materials which could make more sensible solutions. So, uh, and about concrete the COVID. and steel. About the COVID is yes. COVID. I mean, uh, I feel we have found discovered lots of new ways of. Uh, uh, communic communicating with each other, teaching, you know, remotely teaching. And uh, it's a big, it's a good thing that we do, people don't have to congregate to a, to a location to share, share their ideas. And uh, now a new thing is that we have VR, virtual reality. You can actually put a headgear and uh, be with all of you. I will be able to see you around me like the way I feel, but uh, virtually I can be there. So it's becoming a reality. And uh, in, I think it's a good thing that we can avoid a lot of uh, transportation and uh, that way we can save uh, fossil fuel, you know, flying from one place to another unless it is required. So we can also have virtual experience of cities and places. And uh, But there's, there's nothing like being close to a person, like you know, being close and close to each other and hugging each other, or, you know, patting each other for dinner together and all that, you know, but there's a lot of difference. But still, you know, a lot of things we can avoid. This COVID gives us a new way, new way of uh, living, which can, uh, which has shown us that we can live without too much of uh, wastage, too much of wastage of resources, and uh, be more efficient and uh, meaningful, like so. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your view. A lot of uh, uh, yeah. auditorium. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. A lot of auditoriums can, yeah, a lot of auditoriums and, uh, you know, things like that can, cinema halls and all. Now you can get uh, 
it's high definition tv i mean i mean pictures thrown to your uh, to your wall you know by using projectors and or or using a vr glass you can see a, watch a good movie in you know highest possible resolution sitting at home you don't have to even go take your car and go to to a theater to experience that a lot of nice things happening so there's no scope because nowadays the net is uh, becoming you know more efficient you are having a high bandwidth uh, communication possibility when people are trying to throw satellites onto our uh, sky and uh, get us connected in through internet in a much more efficient way and uh, it's, it's it's going to be amazing we can avoid we can uh, see what is required and what is really required and uh, remote uh, shopping like amazon and other kind of shopping this is a much better uh, option you don't have shopping you don't need shopping centers you can get fresh farm to to your home vegetables fresh vegetables and uh, the farmers can live in their villages without coming to cities and i think this backward migration will not happen if we hand if the government handles properly people in the villages can produce meaningful things because every village in the country they have something unique to offer some places they have uh, specific type of weaving of silk some kind of craft that they produce only in that village some food that they produce only in that village that can just be flown into required uh, locations because we have very efficient kind of uh, courier services now which can come anywhere within two or three days you know to to any location so like so a lot of things uh, which we can think about true sir thank you it almost seems like a big thought experiment this whole covid situation uh in we as uh, we'll go to the okay. next final question and uh, this is from jabin usia jabin yes sir hello yes jabin ask you can ask your question yes uh, so for any successful project laborers are one of the important stakeholders we should also look into the laborers who are working in the site for us So, sir, my question is: How easy it is to find the skilled labor to construct buildings with such traditional techniques? And also, tell us uh, how you are managing with your laborers who work on your site. That's it, sir. <coughs> yeah, it's very, very, very important question uh, because uh, labor is a very important, uh, uh, important aspect of all buildings. uh what i do is i i have uh, i i have some i mean people who work for me for a long time you know like they are with me for a long time i train them I, it's not a big deal to train mud uh, technology or any technology for that matter and uh, and we have to first of all we have to know so you can't depend totally on a craftsman because you know a craftsman will have only limited kind of experience to deal with the situation because we have to say if you are, if you want to do timber structure see you have to have uh, a hands on i can do joinery i can do carpentry very well better than the, i mean not posting but I, i i enjoy doing it i can do lay bricks faster than any of my my head mason uh because i after meeting lorry baker and all that i uh, i used to work in site the site for a long time i can throw brick one floor and you know just like you know giving giving the up and like like so. so that kind of thing can uh, so it's not a big deal to 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 train people because you you can if you have if you want to do good buildings you need good labor there's no doubt about it. good craftsmen is very important we have lots of craftsmen carpenters and uh, masons and uh, basic people with common sense they can be trained only thing is that you have to keep them happy and to make them sustain properly we have to also share see them taking care of the, them well and their welfare is very important also right thank you thank you uh, um thank you sir uh, now i will have our vote of thanks uh, by professor justin our uh, head of the department justin sir uh 
Uh, Justin, sir, are you there? Uh, he's there, Pravin. Just one second because he all. Yeah, let's come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening. I hope I'm audible, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, Professor uh, Ajin. Uh, uh, thanks for this uh, almost two hours of insightful uh, sessions. I think um, most of us would have heard of lots of sustainability, and uh, this uh, uh, this session is actually a unique session because uh, uh, we had seen people, uh, or you have ex shared your experiences, you have seen your live projects. So. I think this would have given us lots of hope then in our uh, very academic uh, sustainability uh, discussions. So thank you, Professor. And uh, I think uh, lots of your projects are actually uh, so interesting that uh, it is inspiring us uh, to at least trial out our best in this kind of uh, projects. And um, I, th I hope uh, you would have come across lots of challenges and. Uh, you still are you are trying to do that and uh, i think uh, that one uh, thing is uh, still inspiring us to uh, think of all these sustainable practices uh, for the past two hours i think uh, there was lots of participation from the students also uh, i think uh, what we were think of we were thinking of that as impractical uh, was already proved by you as uh, practical and uh, uh, further affordable also so uh, uh, so it was a nice session, sir. Thanks for being with us. Uh, on behalf of uh, Medas, uh, of the faculty and uh, the students, I th just thank you for this uh, uh, insightful session, and I thank for the part participants for being so patient and uh, uh, participating in this, and the organizers uh, who all made this a successful event. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I think we come to the end of the session so now. Thanks a lot, uh, sir, for being with us, for being a guide and for inspiring, I think, the upcoming architects and many again practicing architects. I think it's a beautiful way to earmark our 10th webinar as part of this series. We are really fortunate and uh, privileged to have you with us. Thanks for your time, sir. Thanks for your wisdom. Thanks for the path you've laid ahead in front of us, for us, most of us to follow. Thanks a lot for your time, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank and you. as part of the webinar series, thank we'd you. like to welcome you to next Saturday's webinar also. Uh, please be with us next Saturday, same time, for another, yet another webinar. Thank you. S sir, feedback. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. So can I can I leave or uh, yes sir yes sir shall I leave or yes. is there uh, all of you this thing no sir that's about it sir so thank you so much thank you thank you so much thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you sir 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 bye bye Yes, so as we uh, we've already informed, we'll be getting your feedback forms in mail and please uh, fill that and send it back to us. It'll be very helpful. Thank you. Hoping to see you again next Saturday. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much.